who I'll introduce in a moment. And then Richard, given the professional that he, that he is, will find a way to um, engage the audience as well. Uh, I'd also like to introduce some of our other panelists. Uh, we have Matthew Breck, and Matt, if you could just raise your hand. Uh, Matt is a recently tenured associate professor in the Department of Marine Environmental Sciences, and his research focuses on the ecosystem consequences of realistic changes in biodiversity. We also have uh, Dan Adams. Dan is an assistant professor in Northeastern School of Architecture, uh, the College of Arts and Media Design, and the School of Architecture are one of our partners moving forward uh, with respect to the sustainability initiative. Folks like Jane Amidon uh, and George Rush and Peter Wiederspan have been uh, very uh, positive in collaborating with us. Um, and Daniel uh, focuses on developing design and planning solutions that achieve sustainability and resilience in urban environments. And then finally, we have Brian Helmuth. Brian Helmuth uh, recently joined us here at Northeastern University. He's a professor in marine environmental science as well as the School of Urban Public Policy and Affairs. Brian is internationally recognized for his research, uh, understanding and predicting the ecological consequences of climate change on rocky shores. And Brian is working with me very closely on the Urban Coastal Sustainability Initiative to enhance the policy dimensions of the initiative itself. So thanks, folks. And Richard, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And, uh, I'm going to s sit kitty corner here so I can see everyone here, and the, the, the hope is that uh, that we will get a lively discussion among these folks, and then at a certain point in the conversation when it feels right, there is a microphone in the audience, and I will invite people to come up and ask questions. Uh, and this is quite a task because there was so much fascinating uh, and deep information that we just heard over the last uh, period of time. It's going to be it's going to be hard to. Uh, you know, to, to get to all of it, but uh, and to explore it all, but uh, but we will we will endeavor to do so. And I wanted to s I I welcome all of you to interact with each other, to disagree, to agree, to whatever, to uh, a little arm wrestling, a little. I guess cricket would not be fair because somebody has an unfair advantage on that front. But uh, but otherwise uh, uh, otherwise uh, to interact. So I think w one thing I wanted to start off with was a an, uh, was a point Steve made near the end that basically we can't really do anything about climate change or not much for the next 50 years. And so that really leaves us in a position of having to figure out how, how to move the other pieces of the puzzle, how to manage the rest of it to, uh, to, uh, to adapt the best we can to the circumstances. And I wanted to throw that, first of all, uh, to Matt as a question, as a, a sort of a starting off point. When you, know, when you hear that kind of uh, proclamation, what do you think and what, 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 are your mo what, do you wanna, what would you suggest we can do? So the first thing that comes to mind is this idea of managing for resilience. So, and, and thinking about what we can do at more local or regional scales to address things that will be exacerbated, for example, by climate change. But and the Great Barrier Reef System is a fantastic example of how these things are being considered. You know, shifts in reef states from coral dominated to algal dominated states. You know, those are associated with things like climate change, but they're the effects are exacerbated, as Ove highlighted, by local scale things like eutrophication and overfishing. And so dealing with those sorts of threats at a more local scale can buy us time and allow the system to potentially bounce back over these 50 years while we actually get our stuff together in terms of the bigger picture global scale climate issues. And do you, do you all agree that basically for 50 years we're kind of stuck with, with uh, increasingly nasty climate change in the ocean? Yeah, I can jump in for a minute here. Um, I've recently spent a lot of time working with the U.S. military and with, with Fortune 500 companies. And, and I think they've got it right that we think of climate change as, as not a, a new individual threat but a threat multiplier. Um, and there are a number of advantages of, of looking at it that way. First of all, as, as we've been talking about, you can start to uh, mitigate some of those other stressors. But from a, a business perspective and from an organizational perspective, it's not that you're, you're creating a new office of climate change. You're, you're taking your existing threats, uh, threats to supply chains, uh, threats to military preparedness, and asking how is that going to change under climate change scenarios in the future. Um, Climate change is, is pretty much always going to be the trigger that fires the bullet and is going to interact with something else. So, so rather than looking at, at climate change as this, this new and scary thing that we don't even know how to begin to address, I think by, by looking at it as a multiplier of existing threats, eutrophication, inappropriate um, coastal construction, then we can start to get a handle on what's likely to happen in the future and how we can adapt to future changes. And Steve, did you want to react to what Matt said? Well, I, I, I think we can still all do our bit by trying to cut down our carbon footprint and try to think about, you know, 
um, living in a more sustainable way, that will cut down greenhouse gas emissions and in the longer term hopefully will lead to some kind of stabilisation of carbon in the atmosphere, but that's going to be a real challenge. Um, I was also at a workshop in um, Potsdam last week and um, this was looking at trying to see what the biodiversity and ecosystem impacts of various geoengineering options would be and I, I was surprised I was invited but um, it was quite quite interesting because some of the some of the options which are being looked at for geoengineering are really quite scary um, and you know I, I would really worry if we went down a a sort of a technological fix rather than trying to actually cut down on our carbon use and we were trying to work out what just what the biodiversity imp implications of some of these things would be and some of the interventions were really really scary and they were they were up there with mad ideas about biocontrol in the 1950s where you know you had some pest and get in something to eat it and then what you got in to eat it became a pest in its own right so i think a lot of unintended consequences so i, I think there's um yeah, we need to be much more precautionary before we start messing with the planet system. Right, and I think one of the scarier approaches uh, has to do with putting particles in the stratosphere to cool the planet and allow us to keep burning fossil fuels, which obviously means we keep putting carbon dioxide into the air and it dissolves into the water. Oh, from your perspective, that probably doesn't seem like a, uh, a, a, a... Well, it puts us on your, your steep red curve, right? Yes, yeah, so of course, um, putting sulfur particles in the outer atmosphere uh, doesn't deal with the ocean acidification issue. One of the, the, um, the geoengineering debate, um, I, I think, is, as Steve says, um, um, very similar to the, you know, the introduction of cane toads to Australia as this sort of bright idea. Um, our track record in managing the atmosphere so far is pretty poor. <laughs> So the idea that we're now going to sort of fiddle with things at a planetary level uh, is, is, I think, quite frightening. Yeah. Now, one of the things I think is missing from this debate is the realism of what has to happen to stabilise CO2 at a safe level. And uh, this has been done very rigorously by the Potsdam Institute and others, where we literally have 700 gigatons of carbon dioxide left to emit to the atmosphere if we're going to stay below 450 parts per million which is a point at which you lose coral reefs and, and all sorts of things happen. And we're um, putting it, for perspective, we're putting up about 30 gigatons a year, right? So, absolutely. So, so yeah. you do the math, divide the 700 by 30, and you get something like 25 years. And that's the period over which we need to reduce emissions to zero. Now, um, we don't see that, you know, that's a very serious change. That's not business as usual. That's not tweaking our carbon footprint or growing some wind farms in India or whatever, it's a major shift in how we do things. And, and for me that's uh, front and centre to this. Uh, at the moment emissions are increasing, not decreasing. Yeah. So, so getting back to the, mm. the issue that, that Matt brought up, which was we need to mitigate, can, is what tools do you have to mitigate the loss of the coral reefs? Is there anything you can do? Well, I love calculations. So one of the ones I did recently was to say, well, okay, um, uh, let's say we lose the Great Barrier Reef, but we're going to um, mitigate the consequences by growing corals. You know, what would that cost? So uh, uh, there's 40,000 um, square kilometres of, of coral habitat on the Great Barrier Reef, and if we planted a coral fragment every five square metres, it would be uh, 40 billion uh, per coral fragment. Now, if we want a bit of biodiversity, because, you know, that's good on coral reefs, well, let's chuck in another 20, 24 species. We're up to a trillion dollars in terms of repair costs. And one of the but things... But the way your, your, your talk suggested that, that repair wouldn't even be permanent because the reefs would then dissolve, Absolutely. Right? We'd have to spend a trillion dollars just keeping that 25 species going, you know, every... Now, the thing is that um, when you look at the estimated costs of dealing with the problem, and the IPCC did this in uh, the fourth assessment report, it estimated the cost of, of stabilising CO2 with you know, changing investments, retiring industries and so on, was actually a 0.12% of GDP growth over the next, um, you know, 50 years. That's an incredibly small amount of money. So you've got adaptation costs, which are huge, and a small mitigation cost. And again, that seems to be forgotten from the debate, that A, adaptation at the scale that we need to 
pre you know, prevent the Great Barrier Reef or coral reefs or anything uh, changing is just way beyond any reasonable proposition of responding effectively to. And the second thing is that each ppm of CO2 added to the atmosphere increases the cost of trying to do that. So we need to link the two and say, what is, what's the economics here? It's clearly to phase out the burning of fossil fuels. Right. It is the economic proposition. Yeah. Dan, let me turn to you. Uh, let's and turn to coastal issues here. Uh, one, one thing that intrigued me also in Steve's talk was the idea that the things that we're doing to, to, to protect the coast from anticipated increasing violent storms and so on is, is having effects beyond just simply, a, you know, just uh, breakwaters and so on. I wonder, you know, what, it, what, what, is that, what is that bringing us? The un, what are the unintended consequences of doing those sorts of things? Well, I guess I want to back up on just that comment we started on, which is this sort of question of, is there much that can be done in 50 years in the trajectory? Or, and it's amazing, because when I'm always startled when I see the sort of dates and the figures, is actually how kind of rapid everything has happened. And when I put that in sort of the urbanism side of things, maybe more in my domain, it, you know, we look at like the Eisenhower Highway Act you know, in the 1960s and how much infrastructure, which is now the, you know, a major CO2 mm -hmm. generator, was developed in just 50 years, right? You know, mm -hmm. so that there's a pretty good model of how much infrastructure can change in, in one generation, right? And so in, in terms of, but the sort of speed and the rapidity that we're capable of working at as a society is something I'm actually always uh, marveled by, perhaps, right? And in many ways, we stand in our own way, right? About not being clear about what our agenda is, what our goals are, and really just putting ourselves to that effort, right? And what's remarkable is what you, what you just said, right? Is how obvious the problem is, <laughs> is the uh, dependence on CO2 right now, and how we could so rapidly change that system, and yet we don't. And to me, that then really raises the question of what we were talking about a moment ago, and it came up in Sylvia Earle's presentation a great deal is just how we place a value on these things and her point was that we place value on a fish as soon as it's deceased right we place value on a tree as soon as we cut it down we place value on rocks as soon as they're excavated out of the ground and so the immediate underpinning to this whole conversation is just how do we put a value currently we actually put a value on because we sell gas and we put it in the atmosphere so the whole economic stream is actually about consumption Right, so how do we change that debate to being about the economy of preservation and conservation as opposed to fueling everything we do by actually a destructive consumption? Yeah, but pushing back a little bit, I mean, it is true that the interstate highway system was created in 50 years or whatever, but it's there and it'll be there for another 50 years. If you look at Manhattan, I mean, obviously one of the problems is we burn a lot of fossil fuels because our current infrastructure demands it, right? And it's hard to, so yeah, you can do new things over the next 50 years, but you haven't solved the problem of everything we've built now, right? I mean, as an architect you, or kind of person, you must be, I mean, how do you, how do you get around that issue? No, well, that is certainly the fundamental <laughs> question, and uh, that's a whole nother debate, which I'm, but no, it's, it's, it's an amazing one, because it's, you know, one of the greatest ironies for me is, uh, you know, the, the big debate, you know, in architecture, for example, 25 years ago, asbestos was used everywhere, and it was a very damaging material, it was insulation, and it was a very efficient material, and then it was come to understand how damaging it is. And then I, I'm always asking, what's, what's you know, we, this came up in Sylvia Earle's question too, is what in 50 years are we going to go back and say, how could we be so foolish, right? And, and when I look at the road system, we just, we tore down an asphalt batching facility in Chelsea, Massachusetts recently, and as we were tearing down the facilities right on the waterfront, of course, it's an oil tank farm for receiving, we, we were very specific about we were not allowed to allow the asphalt to come in contact with the ground because that would be considered an oil spill. <laughs> right, <laughs> and then uh, ironic, and it's it's sort of a no-brainer. And then you go and look at a place like Somerville, Massachusetts, which is 85% coated in either asphalt roofing tar, or which is heated in the sun to release petroleum, which hits the roads, which are heated in the sun, releasing more petroleum, which goes in the you know storm sewer system, eventually goes into the outfalls, immediately into the waterway, and huge amounts of our country are now paved in that material. So, you know, how do we get around that? Well, we have tremendous amounts of infrastructure and just like asbestos was banned because of the economic challenges of lung disease associated with it you know 20 years ago and it now no longer exists as a pallet in architecture will that be asphalt and will that eliminate I mean so policy 
putting economic value on the consequences of these materials, recognizing that the petroleum on the earth and going into the ground is a consequence, and how do we value that? So let me get back to the coastal issue again. We're, we're I mean, these are all huge, I mean, they're all wonderful, huge, important issues that everything else depends on, but let's, let's try to talk about uh, oceans a little bit uh, as well. And, and, and looking at the build up of the infrastructure along the oceans that Steve was talking about, uh, and the unintended consequences of that, do you see, I mean, how big a deal is that perceived to be here? What, are there people thinking, well, gee, maybe we should be thinking about this infrastructure differently, or do, is, it just, is it just sort of one of those things that happens? Well, I'm going to just say one thing, and then I'll be quiet on the point. <laughs> the infrastructure of the coast is a line, right? The infrastructure of human ecology's relation to the natural systems of the ocean extends all the way to each of our houses, right? And that, because everything, it's like Sylvia Earle said, like if you inject something in your arm and your leg, it's, it's all part of one system. And that's, that's where I, I find the question of cities in relationship to the ocean so dynamic is to understand that, you know, what's making its way into the catch basin 10 miles inland is actually making its way eventually to the, you know, the coral reef systems. And so the exact, in, there's so many infrastructural layers, but I think it's understanding, I think too often we draw a divide between those systems and, and how do we start really understanding that they're completely intrinsically linked. Yeah, Steve. What? Yeah, um, I, I think when you're looking at a lot of coastal issues, you have to think on a slightly different time scale than has been, has been the norm in the past. Because we, you know, we've got quite good data on what sea level rise will be like. We've got quite good data on return time of storms. We've got quite good data on the combination of rising sea level with, turn, with return time of storms. And um, you know, I, I'm an I'm an accidental stakeholder in this. And I bought a, a house. I've got a waterfront house, which I bought on a neap tide in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and this is really bad for an intertidal ecologist. Um, when I actually, I, when I actually realised what was going on, I, I'm only a metre above high water springs. So you know, it's great for fishing in the back garden, but it's going to become more convenient over the next 10 or 15 years. Um, but planning regulations would have stopped that happening. We had huge summer floods two years ago in, in England, um, unprecedented summer floods, and in the um, Severn Valley, so all the water from Wales was coming down the Severn Valley, and places were completely flooded, so Worcester, completely flooded, except for the medieval cathedral. Now, those monks knew what they were doing when they built it in the 12th century. It was on a little nice you know, rise of ground and it, it was above the flood line. So just simple things like not building in floodplains, not you know, giving the coast enough room to adjust and, and move up and down as it does, rather than having a, you know, defending a line, trying to do a King Canute, you know, who foolishly tried to, um, his courtiers wanted him to send the tide back. So I think having a much more flexible approach to the coastline, being prepared to do manage realignment and actually to, to retreat, rather than just hold that line, I think is really, really crucial. Um, you know, there's some things that you can't, you know, you're going to have to defend, uh, railway lines, you know, major motorways, etc. And if you do do that, try to do it in an environmentally sensitive way, which minima minimises the impacts. And, you know, you can, you know, it's never a good idea to build a sea defence, but if you are going to build a sea defence and you have to build one, then at least make it a sort of, you know, a bit, a bit bumpy and with some rock pools and things <laughs> in it. You know, it's, it's quite simple steps. Huh. So I guess it sort of gets this gets to a, the broader issue of sort of having people think more long term, and think more think that they're part of an ecology, right, Brian? How does how would you fold that in? Yeah, that, that's exactly what I've been thinking. Listening to what Dan was just saying, and I think that's that's a major goal of this initiative is is to stop thinking of the city as something separate that has an impact on the natural environment, um, but look at it as this, this integrated whole. And then what we keep dancing around here is true cost. And, and how do we get true cost into our economic valuations, into our planning, um, rather than just automatically responding to the crisis of the immediate by putting up concrete, how do we look at the values of existing structures, the, you know, the ability of, of marshes and oyster reefs to uh, reduce some of the shoreline erosion that we otherwise would have to, to build with, um, with concrete. And uh, it's, it's really a change in philosophy um, that we're going to have to 
really rapidly um, enact um, all across the board. So, and we've heard so much bad news stories. I wonder if you could, yeah. is, there, is there a positive example you can cite of what you're just talking about? Yeah, I, I really think so. I, I work with an organization called the Association of Climate Change Officers, and uh, they work a lot with, with Fortune 500 companies. And you kind of go back to this idea of, of um, looking at threat multipliers. Um, I've seen a, a lot going on under the radar in terms of, of large companies, in, in terms of, of federal agencies that are, are really taking this to heart, that are putting this into their, their planning. So we all get really depressed here in the US because legislation is just absolutely stalled. But um, from what I've seen, uh, a lot of this push is going to come from, uh, from businesses, from large corporations, from um, people who recognize that, hey, if I do business as usual, I'm going to go down the toilet. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. No, I was just going to comment. I mean, one of the initiatives that I'm, I'm sure you know my colleagues know much more about that I'd be interested to translate. You know, with the sort of on land industries, we're dealing a lot now with carbon sequestration questions, right? And actually, being that industries are being put on the line to essentially calculate their sort of carbon footprint, you know, and lead to mitigation strategies for landscape preservation of forests primarily. Um, that is interesting just in some of the communities that I've worked with because that's then leading to new initiatives for urban forestry, right? And a return to how do we actually take defunct parking lots, defunct industrial landscapes and actually convert them into urban forests, right? And I would be, of course, I, that seems to be very relevant to the preservation of wetlands, right? And I don't know if there's initiatives that are of that sort. Currently. So can I throw something back at sure. it? Sure. So, so one of the things um, that, that I've run into is this idea that we can recreate value um, through mitigation. So if you pave over a wetland, then you can build one someplace else. Um, viewing this as an ecologist, to some degree you can do that. To some degree you can look at that in, in economic terms. But um, I, I would bet that preserving existing ecosystems will always be a better bet than trying to recreate it. Um, how, does, how does that fit with, with kind of the, the modern approaches now towards um, building coastal structures? I mean, are, are coastal structures, um, natural systems, I included in the planning? Or is it something that, you know, OK, we'll, we'll mitigate by, by building a, a wetland in a Walmart parking lot? Oh, no, I mean, that's a. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not saying you in general, but you, know, you people. Yeah. But but I think there's there's a really interesting conversation that that doesn't happen, and and it's increasingly happened with uh, urban architects and so on, and that is to to link problems of a city with problems of an ecosystem in a changing world. Exactly. And one of those uh, we have a sea, a sea level rise group which has sort of maritime lawyers and urban planners and all sorts of people, plus a few zoologists thrown in and a botanist. And um, what came out of those discussions was the idea that as you change Brisbane, for example, you'll start to get flooding of certain um, urban environments and you've got to withdraw them. Well, they're going to be actually the habitats for mangroves. So linking the two, so as you're withdrawing, you're then creating circumstances for mangroves to grow is probably a smart thing to do. But it's linking up cities as integrated elements of a, of a world which up until now, we've seen them as plopping them down on the coastline, building a port, she'll be right, off you go. Uh, whereas, in fact, when we start to, to, to I think, design anything now, um, we've got to take in what was the externality, the environment, um, which I, I think Sylvia had a great way of saying it, that um, I guess, you know, that we're all in the environment company. We can't get away from it. Yet, up until now, we've been saying, oh, you know, it's not important. But that sort of thinking is really what's going to dominate, I think, the next couple of decades, and it's going to be crucial uh, to our development and our success. Yeah. Uh, similarly, in the, in the UK, we've got, on our east coast, we've got large areas of um, what were formerly salt marshes, which have been reclaimed for agricultural use. A lot of it during the Napoleonic Wars, when food was quite short in the UK, and you know, the, the, the coastline was pushed out. And various schemes have, have breached those walls, allowed salt marshes and wetlands to be uh, recreate, recreated. And, um, you know, it's pretty marginal agricultural land anyway. And at the same time, these marshes provide quite good natural sea defences, which are flexible. So if you've got a good spatial planning 
framework in which to work, which, which is sort of in some ways probabilistic in terms of what's going to happen over the next 25 or 50 years, you, 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 can, seriously, um, you can seriously retreat in a way which in, enhances wildlife and then minimises the risk to property. And you know, in some parts of the UK, we no longer defend, and there's houses falling into the sea, and that's yeah, that's just the policy we decided to go go with coastal erosion, and and try to zone planning to make sure that future property is not exposed to that risk yeah. by building in speculative and dangerous areas. Yeah, it doesn't seem as though we generally do that here, though. When you look at, I mean, the aftermath of of, of Superstorm Sandy, the question was, do we rebuild on these precarious lands mm -hmm. and subsidize that heavily with government funds, or do we uh, let it go back to nature? Dan, what happened? <laughs> well, it, it's it's still a debate, <laughs> and that's yes, sometimes Dan. that's yeah. yeah the, thanks for that. I'm blaming it on you. Uh, sometimes, no, but uh, there's uh, several you know housing uh, developments currently even on uh, Cape Cod, you know, on Chatham, for example, that are being allowed to essentially return to sand dune structures. You know, the South Shore of uh, Staten Island is in is very much up for debate right now as to essentially allowing it to restore, uh, not even restore, but allow what nature did to be preserved. In fact. Uh, mainly because of those insurance reasons. I mean, groups like FEMA, now just from an architectural perspective, the ability to insure a, a building in a wetland, in a flood zone, has become exorbitantly expensive, right? So just that sheer, again, that's this question of value, right? And that was not done by anything other than insurance companies not wanting to be put on the hook anymore <laughs> for floodable structures. And so FEMA has enacted all sorts of you know, measures by how architecture has to be designed to allow water to pass through and under houses. That raises the cost of building in the waterfront. That actually starts making it so people stop building on the waterfront. So, though it, I wouldn't say that that, and sometimes those kind of decisions and things are made uh, very incrementally, uh, simply because, again, insurance companies don't want to, to pay that fee. And that's right. dramatically changing new house development on the waterfront. Yeah, mm -hmm. but people still, I guess, want to take risks, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, so, so, so are we going to end up with disposable housing, you know, that you have the house until it gets destroyed by a storm and it's designed so that you can rebuild it quickly or, you know, I mean, maybe that's... Uh, Hopefully not out of plastic, a right? Floating it's washing house. out the sea, right? <laughs> well, actually, they do Plus that... it in, doesn't choke a turtle. In, yeah, they play, they're that. playing with floating <laughs> houses in Holland, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in, in many bits of the UK coast, there's a lot of... Um, caravan parks, trailer parks, which are used for, for, for people on holiday and things, and they're, they're in, often in low-lying areas, um, protected by sea defences. Um, and the, the, there's a famous poem by, by Sir John Betjeman, which was written in 1940, which goes along the lines of, Come friendly bombs fall on slough, because slough was the epitome of <laughs> urban creep. And I, ha I have to say that I've paraphrased this on occasion, sort of say, come friendly waves, wash away rill, which is <laughs> one of the most ugly coastal resorts in North Wales. Mm. So, you know, I think, I think you could think about a different f configuration of urban coastline. Um, and the economic value for a lot of these coastal activities is actually quite marginal. So there would have to be compensation, there would have to be some kind of managed retreat, but I think it would be possible to resolve those various interests. Um, and at the end of the day, the insurance companies will probably drive it because the premiums on those caravan sites, those trailer parks in, in risky coastal locations, will go through the roof. That they, they, they will no longer be economically viable. Right, in, unless we decide to keep bailing people out with federal funds. But mm -hmm. let, let me change the uh, turn, make a little turn in the conversation here because there, I mean, there was so much stuff to mine in, in the in the in the talks this morning. And let me turn back to Matt and uh, ask you about w one thing we heard in Steve's talk was about the this the value that he's finding in this long term data sets that he's that he's found, which are uh, which are remarkably few when you look around the world. How many you know how how little we have of that? And I guess the question is, what is what is the value of that? And uh, I mean, beyond just sort of documenting the demise of uh, of these coastal or the or the transformation of, of of various ecosystems and so on. So I mean, long term data sets unquestionably provide an incredible resource for our ability to to look back and then ultimately forecast what may happen. But like you've just pointed out, they're they're really rare. And so I guess my question, and this is one thing I wanted to 
pose to Steve is, you, know, you have these great case studies, but they're fairly limited. And it's not like in the face of impending climate change, we can say, all right, let's start a 100-year time series right now and move forward with it, because that's not going to do us any good at this point. So what, you know, what is the scope of inference we can draw from those existing studies, and um, you know, how does that contribute to, you know, how, how does our understanding of what's happening, these great data sets, you know, Southwards data sets and things like that, um, how does that contribute to our under understanding of other places around the world? Well, I think you you can generalize some things from them, but we've already uh, we've already picked on Tony Underwood a few times. Uh, yeah, you can generalize on some things. <laughs> um, uh, also, th there's a lot of informal information you can use. Um, Chris Harley's done some marvelous stuff looking at old photographs of So Nation at Stan um, at Hopkins, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of information out there of, uh, using historical approaches. I mean, Southwood got back to the 12th century by looking at um, customs books from ports in Devon and Cornwall showing export of herring or pilchards and looking at um, cuttings out of newspapers. So he managed to get his data set back 100 years. So you can use historical methods. You can, you can link to paleo methods as well. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the challenges is sort of closing that that time window between where long-term historical data works and paleo data doesn't, you know, stops working. So you can do it that way. My other thing is it's never too late to start a time series. You know, um, somewhere like uh, like Nahant, where you know you can walk out on the shore. Digital photography is fantastic. You can just go out and take digital photographs. I don't count barnacles anymore, I just take digital photographs. I sometimes lose the files and stuff, but... Um, or store them on magnetic tape, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, that is an issue, actually, is, up, is upgrading your, your information storage systems. Um, but you can do an awful lot. Three years data is better than no data, and, and I think it's, it's part of an attitude, it's part of a mindset. I mean, I'm, you know, on Saturday I'll be chucking quadrats, um, to avoid my family. Um, so, you know, uh, this is being filmed, by the way. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mum. Um, so um, you know, you, you've got to be quite, you've got to be quite persistent to keep these things, these things going. But you know, N N Nahant's a, a great place to, you know, I'm sure you've got lots of controls from experiments. You know, so look at your control data. That's that's your long term um, long term data. So it doesn't take very much to to start a time series, and they're amazingly they're amazingly valuable, and they're so fragile. And the, the um, continuous plankton recorder um, survey, which is dead cheap, you know, it's classic British doing stuff on the cheap. You know, you get people's other boats, and you tow this thing behind, which catches plankton on a silk net. And that was nearly closed down in 1987 um, by, by the UK government. What and does it, the plankton tell you? Well, it, it tells you an awful lot about change in the ocean. And it's on such a broad scale because this is towed by ships of opportunity. Simple device is just a silk mesh on a spoil. That was, that was nearly closed down and it was rescued as a separate charity. And these things are really fragile. So, A, you've got to make sure that any time series you've got, you maintain. And secondly, don't be scared to start up time series. It, you know, time passes. Five-year time series is, is ex extremely valuable. So, you know, start them. And you can do them using a lot of quick and dirty methods. It, it's, it's quite important to have broad-scale coverage and do things in a you know, a reasonably quick and dirty way, rather than do very, very detailed observations. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I think detailed observations are great, but I think you can do an awful lot to put things into perspective. And you can use citizen science for some of this as well. Mm. Um, is, going out on the seashore is not, not expensive. People can take digital photographs and send them to I was going to say, I, don't ask me to distinguish those barnacles you were showing. No, no, no. Unless you've got the red dots on the rocks already. No. <laughs> but I, I, was on, I was on telly about a month ago and um, on a programme on BBC4 about rock pools and this very nice lady got in touch and sent me an email and said, can you identify these mollusks? And I said, yes. And I, so she sent me the file and I opened it and it was they were oceanic stalk barnacles. 
so they weren't mollusks at all, but they were mollusks until about 1830. <laughs> um, but she was abs- it, it took me 10 minutes to send her an email back and say, look, these are, you know, these are really interesting, they're oceanic stalk barnacles, they're related to shrimps and crabs, they were mollusks until 1830, um, and they're really neat and they're quite common. And she was so chuffed. So that's the power of what a digital photograph can do. And you can use digital photography as voucher specimens. So I think there's a big role for citizen science, provided you've got quality control. I wouldn't trust anyone to identify those barnacles. Alan Southwood put me through a six-year apprenticeship before he let me go. I used to have to do blind tests. (laughs) It's the wrong barnacle, Steve. He was deaf. You know, so... And and I'm I'm, I'm equally, you know, I'm, I'm equally quite with some of my um, PhD students and, and postdocs in terms of getting them trained up. But there's some things which are dead obvious, you know, Ascophyllum's Ascophyllum. And that's, that's a species that's at risk from climate change, and that's something that can be very, very... Um, uh, Agrac. That's something that can be very easily surveyed. So you can yeah. do a lot with citizen science, I think, as well. Yeah. Brian, what's been your experience with the time series and the value you found from them? Have you tried to start any long-term time series? Actually, we are starting that right now. Um, I, I've had the opportunity to work with Steve's group for a while, and, and it really is a unique data set. And, and I, I would offer that, that the one major problem with all these projections of, of climate change, I'm a, I'm a modeling geek, and so I think in terms of models, is, is that uh, we're projecting to novel conditions. We're con- projecting to situations that we haven't seen before. So our choices then are to, to generate hypotheses that we can go back and test. The only way to do that is with these long-term time series. But the strength of that is if you understand enough of how these interactions drive the system, then you have a lot more confidence of what's going to happen in the future. So to me, I mean, this is where the, the heavy duty physiology and genetics and, and ecology come in, that if you really have a handle on the underlying mechanisms, then it's no longer just observation and extrapolating the line. It's, it's taking what we know, testing it using these long-term data. Um, and then drawing inferences about the likely um, responses in the future. And, and then, all of a sudden, we have tools that we can um, use to plan for the future. I mean, un- understanding the, the processes, that the, the barnacle modeling we did, we had a good long-term data set, but without the, the rough garden model, which we modified a bit, we couldn't have, we couldn't have done the prediction. Mm. And we also knew from Joe Connell's famous work about the interactions between these species. So we, you know, we knew a lot about what we were modelling from experiments done in parallel with long-term observations. I mean, I, you know, I don't spend all my life doing long-term observations, but um, it's really important to have the experiment. I mean, Ove's mesocosm works fantastic. You know, if you've got long-term data, modelling and experiment, and bring the three together, it gives you much, bas- much better predictive power than just observation alone. Yeah, and I don't, Ove, I don't know if you... Uh, if you if if, model, if this has been a part of your work as well, I mean, obviously, the changes of the coral reefs have been so dramatic, I guess, in, in, in human memory that you don't even maybe need to go back to his, more historic data and so on. But Oh, no, I was, uh, while that discussion was going on, um, finding myself in, in, in agreement that it's, it's multiple lines of evidence that you have to use. And so with corals, we've got one archive which... Uh, is pretty unique, and that is that in long-lived corals that can live for centuries, possibly as long as a thousand years, you can drill into them and look at um, calcium carbonate deposition. Because they grow like a tree, right? So this thing grows and eventually can become really as big as this room, in in terms of, that would be a big one. Um, (laughs) Wow. Maybe the lights and so on there. And that archive is just like a tree. It grows by rings, and you can take the calcium carbonate out, and you can determine sea temperature within 0.1 of a degree Celsius. You can, do, you can actually um, get the calcification rate in, you know, 1409, you know, in summer. And what that's done for us is to take all these other lines of evidence, and we've actually now seen on the Great Barrier Reef, you know, as we were predicting, um, a slowdown of calcification, which is very consistent across uh, 328 different cores from the entire reef. And that information is just, you know, <laughs> invaluable. On its own, it's, um, it's got limited use, because you'd need to know the processes and the other bits and pieces that go into this. But once you've got that, it's a powerful story 
uh, about change. Yeah, I, I, I do want to follow up with that and then I come back to you, Steve, which is, uh, I mean, when, when, I, when I tell people about ocean acidification, what's happening with corals, their, re, their response is, well, we heard some variation of it today, which is that it's an unknown future. We don't, you know, how can you predict if you're going into a place where we, where we haven't, you know, been for hundreds of thousands or millions of years, perhaps, uh, where the conditions may have been quite different that time. And so, hmm. so at, you know, some people just, maybe it's crossing fingers or something, but they're saying, well, maybe this corals will adapt. I mean, they've been through a lot. And I wonder how you, how you answer that question short of just letting the experiment run, the, the our, our planetary experiment. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I, I, th I think we, we get to know things um, and we get understandings about how systems work. And I, I, I think if you had a, a paddock full of sheep and you decided to withhold water, you'd know what would happen to the sheep, right? Um, you would just cross your fingers and go, well, maybe they'll just evolve. <laughs> or maybe, you know... Um, become camels. Be some <laughs> 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 yeah, camels, <exactly>. huh? <laughs> but so I think, you know, as we're building this picture up of risk, um, I think it's informing our decision making and making it you know, more certain. And of course there are uncertainties, there are things that might pop out, things that might change, but I think we're on the side of the ledger here that's saying that, well, you know what, out of all these different systems, most of them are trending towards ones which are not great for humans, be that the environment or their agricultural systems or whatever. And as I said before, the cost of trying to deal with those changes and, and adapt in the you know, societal context um, is huge. And it, in, you know, in, in the words of, I want to go back to this, and in the words of you know, one of your most prominent uh, presidents, you know, it's the economy stupid that's here. It's, it's all, it is about money in some ways. And maybe we do need to cost things, even though I want my little fish to be priceless. Um, but we need to make this system recognize externalities and recognize real costs and make decisions on the basis of that. Because we're not doing that with this issue. Yeah. Steve, did you want to follow up? Well, I just wanted to make a minor point. Um, you know, there's good, there's good um, organisms here for sclerochronology. Mm. Um, there's long-lived clams. Mm. Um, Art Arctica Icelandica can live four or five hundred years. And uh, former colleagues in, in Bangor University in the UK have used that to get back to the medieval warm period. And, and then using death assemblage animals that they could date, get even back to, you know, sort of um, when the Romans were in North Wales. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of tools and, and you, you, you can really get some, some feel for what the level of change is. On an optimistic note, though, I do, I do think that in both the US and in, um, in Europe, in the last 20 or 30 years, we've cleaned up a lot of pollution, we've done a lot of things with um, better anti-fouling paints, we've done a lot of things on catchment management which has uh, reduced nutrient and sediment flushes, flushing going into the coastal zone, um, we've done an awful lot to tidy up eutrophication and deal with um, sewage pollution and disposal of sewage sludge. So you know, when I was a student in Liverpool in the 1970s you could smell the Mersey on neap tides. You know, it was really pongy. It was a great, great ecosystem for um, for, for uh, production of hydrogen sulfide with anaerobic bacteria. But due to deindustrialisation and a certain amount of money spent on clean up, you know, the Mersey is now a, a living, vibrant uh, estuary, which it hadn't been since the 1870s. So you crushed this uh, ecosystem that was based on hydrogen sulfide. Exactly. Oh, yeah. But but we had, you know, we. We, we started catching salmon and sea trout in the Mersey in the 1990s, which is really exciting. They hadn't been there for a long, long time. Previously, a Mersey trout was a euphemism for something that used to be floating up and down the river. Okay, we will uh, hold that for one time. Uh, we should open this up to questions. I thought we were going to go into lunch, but I guess that would be mean. So we'll try to we'll try to end at lunchtime. So there's a microphone here. If you'd like to ask questions, please come up to the microphone. Uh, I believe this is being streamed. Uh, come, come on up and uh, over you you were gonna I just wanted to reveal something about myself which I don't think people believe and actually I'm an optimist <laughs> <laughs> and I, I like to point to things like um, uh, the fact is at this point in history we have um, several billion people swapping ideas like we've never done before um, we literally have um, a science which is allowing great, a great understanding of the past and a great understanding of the future. So um, 
and and the fact is that every, you know we we don't predict very well what's you know five years out and when we get cracking on a problem we tend to solve it really quickly as steve was saying so i think in the next decade we're going to see some phenomenal progress against this problem and we will be pushed along by you know a weather system which will you know, hit us every so on and keep reminding us that um, we need to go down this road. So I'm very optimistic. Okay. <laughs> a question. And I'm not on drugs, all right? <laughs> oh, so uh, please introduce yourself and ask a short question. Okay. Um, I'm Sheila Paddock. I'm a professor at UMass. Excuse me, UMass Amherst, and I have a little cold, sorry. Um, I want to tell a really short anecdote and then throw down the gauntlet. Is that too long? No, go, go for it. Okay. So I'm a scientist, right? And I was out in the field two months ago. Um, studying uh, animals that make sound at the bottom of the sea. Seven of us took airplanes out to this place and we were studying anthropogenic noise and we drove a motorboat out there every day. <laughs> and the trip didn't go very well. We got a little data but we didn't get the data that we needed. And I sat there on that boat on the last day when I realized the last dive was going to be an awful and had this epiphany and it linked this problem that I have with my students in my classes, which is that they don't want to hear about this anymore. It's too overwhelming. It, literally, this is the feedback I get from my undergraduates. And I had an epiphany that we sit at these, and I don't mean this in a critical way to all of you, but we, we sit and we talk about Fortune 500 companies and all the stuff that ought to be done. And I'm looking at this table after Sylvia Earle's talk last night. You're drinking a water out of plastic bottles. They forced and, us to do that. Yeah. But, no, but, and, and, I'm, and I'm saying this from the perspective of a scientist who just dumped buttloads of carbon into the atmosphere for a failed research trip. So here I'm going to throw down the gauntlet. What is Northeastern's Marine Science Center going to do to lead the pact to show that scientists are going to be the first to change the industry? That we and so I came back from my trip and I said, I want to do my work on sailboats and I want to have zero input, no anthropogenic noise. Mm -hmm. And there is a company in San Francisco that rents sailboats for research to researchers and researchers have done it, like Mark Block and other people have done that. And I would like to know what, what, what's going to be done. Are it, mm -hmm. How about a conference like this where, I'm sorry, but no, no plastic cups for water, you bring your own. Um, or a $5 discount for showing your tea card. So we are a huge industry. Scientists are a huge industry. Mm. We are the ones who are proclaiming this stuff. We're saying this stuff, and we're sitting here drinking mm. out of plastic water bottles. So that's me throwing down the gauntlet. What is Northeastern going to do to lead the pack for how scientists are going to behave differently and, and make these changes? Good question for Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sheila. Yeah. <laughs> so Sheila, a point well taken. And, and I think the the trade-offs here, and I, and I was thinking this looking at, at, at Ove's um, uh, underwater 3D tours, is in, in order to get people to care, we have to have empathy. In order to have empathy, we have to have hands-on experience. In order to have hands-on experience is, is kind of the, the Schrodinger question. You can't interact with the environment um, without being there. And so I, I think to a large extent, we can start to mitigate our impacts by doing some of these virtual connections. Um, you know, we've, we've started exploring having virtual conferences. Um, you know, having nobody travel. Um, we've started uh, the idea of of uh, having virtual tours, virtual experiences across different continents, so that we're not traveling, but we're also exposing school kids and other people to those environments. So. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I fully understand you're right. We're, we're drinking out of water bottles here, but there's there's always going to be this push and pull between how do we get people's hands dirty? How do we get them out to the field? How do we as scientists get out there? Um, I, I would argue I don't think we could get all of our work done in time if we did it all on sailboats. Um, I, I think we have a really hard time launching the Johnson Sea Link from a sailboat. Um, and, and so it, there is no easy answer to this. So it's, it's all a question of, of ethically, you know, what do we do? So I think, I think you have to look at this as a total carbon budget. And I think about this quite a lot. I'm probably the one with the highest carbon footprint here having flown from Australia for this conference. And 
it goes a little like this. That um, um, so if I so for example at my institute we also do renewable energy. So we have now we're going to be moving into a zero carbon, zero waste building next month. Um, we've got solar fields now that are three megawatts, which was very large. Um, you know, I'm now um, probably, uh, you know, when you look, look at the total organisation that we're actually, you know, um, a net um, carbon sink. I agree with this idea that we should walk the talk, and I, I know I haven't opened the bottle of water, <laughs> <laughs> and I do take it seriously as well. But, but it is that thing. I mean, if we were on, it, you know, let's say we were just on holidays flying to the US and back um, willy-nilly, then I think there would be a big problem. But we've, I think you've got to see it as an integrated whole, that by perhaps getting something going through the Catlin CV survey, right, that may change minds and lead to massive change in industry, for example, that's, that's paying attention. So I don't know, I, I, I go back and forth, forth on this. Um, sometimes I, I feel like I should just get a caftan and, you know, retire somewhere and, don't, and not have electricity. That'd be actually quite nice, I would imagine, in our busy lives. But you wouldn't be addressing the problem that we need to get out there right now and be quite in people's face to get the change that has to happen. I mean, I, I know it's very unfashionable, but we have to get off fossil fuels within the next... 20 years, otherwise we are in trouble. And that's something you can't do from your home on video. You've got to be there with those industry people and say, look, you have to change. It is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Gas is not a transitional fuel, you know, yeah. as is often stated. So, Nat I mean, natural gas, yeah. Natural yeah. gas, yeah. yeah. So oh, old gas, right? Gasoline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we have, yeah. Um, Matt, do you have a thought about this as well? Do you, uh, um, I agree that it's a hard line to walk, you know, and, and it's easy to get caught in this trap of, oh, we're out there doing the science yes. that will contribute to our understanding of the consequences of global change so we don't have to worry about things like these water bottles. Yes. Um, but I agree with you, especially, Ove, that thinking as institutions about ways that we can reduce our carbon footprints and thinking about those big pictures, um, you know, that's really that. That's one thing that we root that is incredibly important. Yeah. And Steve, you mentioned in your talk that your institute's reducing its carbon footprint by twenty percent in uh, in a fairly in fairly short order. Is that? Do you think you can make that happen? Well, all so, uh, all universities in the UK are under pressure to reduce their carbon footprint, and um, you know, there's a People and Planet League table which influences students where they where they go to study and, and sustainability is not just about the environment it's about um, socioeconomics and, and, and health and well-being so fair trade you know, giving attention to supply chains I think is really important so there's a certain amount of pressure in it and, and I have to say it does make you think I mean okay you know I'm, I'm not too keen about drinking water from plastic bottle but at least these days this is a recyclable plastic bottle which it might not have been five or ten ten years yeah. ago um, and you're not planning to chuck it in the in the uh, in the bay. So. No, exactly. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. watching closely. So, no, no. Yeah, but, but, uh, we, we're running a little short of time. So, and, and but I, but I think you know I think all organisations are aware of that. And I, I actually think the important thing is to do a series of small steps and reinforce success. Um, you know, we've we've recently gone to recycling in the university, which makes the staff do the recycling. Um, and you know, empty your bins and everything and sort the litter. And I had huge pushback from the chemistry department who thought this was a real waste of time. Mm -hmm. um, I very often station to go and chuck my banana skins into the recycling bin because I'm in the chemistry department. As <laughs> um, and it's just about attitudes. And within three months or so, everyone sat all down and they got just used to the idea that you just did it, you know. Yeah. And, you can. I think the important thing is is to do small incremental steps and then have feedback and show what successes are. You can really turn people off if you get too evangelical about it. Yeah. Another question. Last question. Hi, I'm Mark Patterson. I'm an incoming professor at the Marine Science Center. Uh, this is a question about uh, built infrastructure for uh, Dan and possibly Stephen. Uh, we've got this marvelous picture behind you there of built infrastructure on the water's edge. <laughs> Uh, there's an interesting project uh, going on at Northeastern called Voters, which is using uh, cars and trucks in part as sensors to look at the uh, 
health, if you will, of uh, the roads and highways and bridges uh, in metropolitan areas. Are there ways that we could use the built infrastructure at the water's edge, some of which is not very attractive, as I learned uh, from Dan over dinner last night, and uh, are there ways we could use the built infrastructure as a sensor network? Are there ways we could use the waterside built infrastructure at coastal cities to perhaps uh, enable or aid some of the ecosystem functions that have been lost through, uh, say, filling in of uh, wetlands as occurred in Boston over the centuries? Yeah, well, I think what your question, so I'm not, you know, a sensor expert. I mean, certainly there's tremendous amounts of data that uh, exist in the harbor. And what's funny is, you know, sometimes what I'm baffled by a bit is sometimes there's just really obvious sort of simple things. And I'll tell a little anecdote because sometimes you can collect very advanced data and then realize you're overlooking really simple things. I, I was working with an artist who had built an eco-sustainable barge in New York. And this, this barge, you might know the artist, very famous artist, Mary Mattingly, and she lived on the barge for three months in the summer. She processed her own urine into clean water to feed plants, which she then ate. So she literally supported a community of two artists floating in the harbor. Now, the barge, if I had to estimate, was probably a 10,000 ton capacity barge weighing 2,000 tons of steel itself, had to be tugged around the harbor by tugboats to put it in place. And one day, uh, one of the guys who works on our dock uh, in Staten Island, she was calling the tugboat to come move the barge. And he said, hey, can you just wait 20 minutes? <laughs> and he, she waits 20 minutes, he grabs one line, and the tide changes and the bar <laughs> moves up the harbor, right? And uh, they moved it about 200 feet with three guys on shore and lines, right? And it, and it struck me very interestingly that that's an incredibly simple system, right? We don't actually monitor the tides at all for incoming ships other than maintaining draft, for example. But in terms of just looking at very simple systems of the waterfront, integrating them with our uh, industrial sort of systems, in that case saved actually, you know, a great deal of fuel for the moving of very heavy objects, right? And, you know, do we ever think about those types of systems of actually waiting? And the reason we don't is because the ships are on a rapid time schedule and time is money. So why wait to an incoming tide to actually assist vessels coming in when, uh, you know, you'll actually fight against the tide and burn that extra petroleum, right? And so it, I think what's interesting about it is, uh, of course, there's, m I think, many ways to sort of monitor those systems. The question is, what are we going to do with them, right? <laughs> How can we actually capitalize on those? Uh, and I mean, that's, you know, even like this water question, you know, it's, it's amazing what we do with water in the urban environment to essentially let it run off the roofs, it picks up the contamination of the roofs, it gets down into the ground, it runs across the ground, it picks up contamination, then we have to filter it, we have to actually typically pump it, it has to make its way out to the harbor, it goes through a 10 mile long pipe to be discharged out in the harbor, and then meanwhile we're pumping water in all the way from you know western parts of the state at great energy expense. The MWRA, for example, is doing a great deal of changing over to renewable wind turbine driven energy. But that just water network then, so we're paying to discharge the water, we're paying to bring water in. And the key word in that is that we're paying, right? That's fundamental to keeping people employed, keeping the economy of things. And again, it gets to this question of how do we change the economic driver of paying us to be inefficient to actually, why don't we just take the roof right, the water right off the roof ha and, and drink it in our buildings, right? I mean, we clearly have the technology, but you lose, to be honest, you lose that entire economy, right, the, that we in many ways depend on. So how do you change that? Yeah, look, I think we are, we're eating into lunch, so to speak, and, uh, and, for, and I, need, I think we need to wrap this up, but I do want to end on, a, on an up note and get back to Uv's. Uh, Ove's optimism, uh, and I think the, the I guess the optimistic message for pe for young people in the audience thinking about going into science is we've been hearing you know there's obviously you can document terrible things that are happening to the environment, but also I think where this discussion started was there are things you know it's time to think about things you can do to make a difference on the margins even if you can't solve global warming. I think that's uh, there are th clever things you can do, and I think if people are sort of thinking ahead about careers and so on, one thing they can think about is how to 
take these ideas and start to solve them. Getting back to the interstate highways, things you can make a big difference in, you know, over a period of time. But you need people to to have those ideas. And so I hope that I hope that message came through in, uh, amidst all of the other kind of de depressing stuff that we're talking about as well. But I think you know the challenge, you know that that you know more and more people are going into these fields, right? Kids are young students, scientists, and so on, because they care about these issues and they want to make a difference. And I think if you can tell them they're going to have a career where they can actually do good and not just document bad, uh, that's, uh, I think that's, that's, that's a note that would propel people uh, maybe a little bit more than just the, the, you know, some of the real tough problems we are facing. So anyhow, thank you all very much for your patience uh, this morning, and uh, I guess it is now lunchtime, so thanks. Thank you, everyone. Um, so lunch is uh, upstairs in the Cloud Suites. Um, I'd like to thank the DeFilippi family for sponsoring the lunch. I very much